Open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to begin by looking at verse 6. If you weren't with us last Sunday, for the month of January, we have suggested a theme really for the rest of the year, talking about living wholeheartedly, what it means to do everything we do well for the glory of God. If you think about it, Colossians 3 reminds us, whatever you do, Do it for the glory of God, not unto men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your reward. So whether you're here at church, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, in your neighborhood, in your school, wherever that is for you, everything we do is to be done for the glory of God. So we've talked about living wholeheartedly. Today we're going to talk about what it means to give wholeheartedly. And I really believe this is the area of life where you will see some of the greatest blessings of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look with me if you would, beginning in verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible, indescribable, unspeakable gift. You are never more like Jesus than when you give. There was a survey taken a number of years ago about those who gave the most in the United States, percentage-wise, to churches and charitable organizations. What they found was that the people who made the most, numbers-wise, those who made over $200,000 a year, tended to be those who gave the most. Those who had more, gave more. What was surprising is that percentage-wise, those who made less than $20,000 a year gave more than those who made $200,000 a year. Why is it that often the ones who have the least are the very ones who give the most. It's true in the Gospels as well. Jesus will say to the boy who has five loaves and just two fish, bring it to me, I'll multiply it. What little I have, it belongs to the Lord. The woman who lays down her ointment at the feet of Jesus, she's given more than everyone. She has anointed me with everything that she has. And rather than focusing on how much you give, How you give, the manner in which you give, is just as important. The Apostle Paul is taking up a love offering for the churches, for the famine relief in Jerusalem. He's taking it from the Gentiles to give it over to the Jews, and he writes them ahead of time, knowing that they will be generous in what they give, and in how they give, and in the spirit in which they give. And instead of simply putting a dollar amount, a sign on this is how much you need to supply, He instead explains to them what their attitude towards giving should be. He reminds them that God loves a cheerful giver. Perhaps you heard of the mom who was trying to train her little girl how to give, and she gave her a dollar and a quarter for the offering one Sunday. She said, honey, it's entirely up to you. You can give the dollar, you can give the quarter, your choice. Obviously, you know, hoping that she would give the dollar. And on the way home, she asked her, she said, what did you end up giving? She said, well, I was going to give the dollar, but then I heard the preacher say that God loves a cheerful giver. And I decided that I would be way more cheerful if I kept the dollar and gave the quarter instead. Sometimes that's our attitude towards giving, isn't it? 
And isn't it ironic that this world has sold us a bill of goods to measure our worth by how much we have rather than by how much we give? Jesus will talk more about giving than almost any other subject in the Gospels. In fact, more than heaven and hell combined because he will let us know that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God loves a cheerful giver. Not under compulsion, not reluctantly. This is what God's word says in 1 Chronicles 29.9, talking about the people of Israel. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. I like what Billy Graham says. If a person gets his attitude toward money straight, it will help him straighten out all areas of his life. Many of our problems tend to revolve around money. Too much of it, too little of it. Needing to save more, needing to spend more. When Jesus says your attitude towards money really ought not to be on receiving, it ought to be on giving. And he says the reason is because it is ultimately a measure of our faith. Give, and it will be given unto you. You know, in many cases, the last name that you have, not in every case, but in many cases, the last name you have defines what your ancestors used to do. So you look at David, his last name is Cook. My mother's maiden name is Cook. Very often there's a lot of cooks in the, in the lineage there. My last name is Fields. And I can tell you for generations on both sides of my family, mom and dad's side, we've had a generation of farmers. Unfortunately, that skipped a generation when it comes to me, and I know very little about farming. In fact, most of my farming experience has been spending the day out on the farm with church members rather than with family members. And I've tremendously enjoyed those times, getting to drive the the tractor and getting to sit in the combine. It's especially fun around harvest time, and then they fix you a big meal afterwards, or at least they do for me, so that's always the, the enjoyable part. I don't know a whole lot about farming, but I do know this. You cannot reap what you do not sow. And in the kingdom of God, your return is directly related to your investment. The return you receive, in fact, is entirely dependent on the investment you make. And you can't expect to receive the blessings of God if you're not actively heeding and obeying the word of God. You have to trust him with everything you have. And can I just say this? If you don't trust God in this area... You won't trust him in any area. But if you can trust him in this realm of your life, you can trust him in every realm of your life because it's ultimately not about what God wants from you. It's about what he wants for you. To trust him. To believe him. To take him out of his word that when you give to the point that it costs you something, that is when the God of this universe shows up and says, I will be your portion. I will provide on your behalf. He tells us our attitude towards giving, our faith towards giving. And then he reminds us of our obedience in giving. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. You'll remember Jesus sharing the story of the parable of the talents. One man was given one talent, one was given three, one was given five. The master of the house comes back and receives a reward from the one who had five. He says, master, I've converted this to 10. The one who had three had had doubled it into six. And then he went to the one who had one. And the one who had one, rather than saying, this is what I I've done, said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man. And so I went and buried what I had, and I didn't do anything with it. And the master of the house says something incredibly condemning to him. He says, go out and depart from me, because you have not used what I gave you to use. That is the attitude that Jesus has towards what's been given to us. Not equal gifts but equal sacrifice. And if you're not using what God has given you in order to bless his kingdom and to bless others, he says you also are in disobedience. I can hear what you're saying right now. He said, well, that's nice for you to talk about, but I don't have anything to give. That may be true. 
But often the time when you most need to give is when you don't have it to give. That's the time when you need to trust God the most, when you have the least. Richard Stearns is the current president of World Vision. He's just recently announced his retirement, an organization that literally reaches all over the globe, helping people who are in hunger, people who have disease. Great organization that's led in so many different areas. He talks about, in 1987, being one of the toughest years of his life financially. You remember the stock market crashed significantly at that time, the largest drop in one-day history. And he said in one day, he lost a third of his retirement and savings, everything that he had. And he spent the next three months trying to figure out how in the world he was going to get it all back. He made a big mistake, he said later on, by selling off all those investments, which is actually one of the worst times you can sell when the market takes a, takes a dip if you're an investor. And he said he so spent time worrying over this that one day his wife came to him and she said, you know what we've got to do now? He said, what's that? She said, we've got to make sure that we give to organizations that we hold dear. He said, what do you, what do you mean we have to give? We've just lost everything. We, we can't afford to give. She said, no, this is the time when we really learn to be obedient to God and trust him for who he is. Richard Stern says he, he, he sat down and wrote these checks for which he knew he was going to have to depend on God to supply. And once he did that, a weight of relief just completely came over him. Because here's the truth of the matter. If you don't give when you have a little, you're not going to give when you have a lot. And if you can trust God when you have nothing, Oh, surely you can trust him when you have everything in Christ. He tells us it's an attitude of giving. It's faith towards giving. It's obedience in giving. But then we see worship through giving. He reminds us of what God has done in Christ. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures forever. It all comes down to how you view possessions and finance. Everything that we have belongs to God. It's just on loan, and really it's a stewardship of the gospel because it's been entrusted to us. You wouldn't say to someone who was delivering your package, and you said, deliver this package to the next house, I need it to get there, and the mailman or the post office or UPS or FedEx just kept it in the house. They said, you know what, I've got this package, I'm going to take it home with me instead, instead of getting it to where it needs to go. You would say, no, I've, I've given this to you so that you can give it to someone else. That is the entire measure of the gospel. Jesus does not give this to you so you can keep it to yourself. He gives it to you so that you can give it to someone else. And they can give it to someone else. And it can multiply because I recognize what God has done in Christ for me. And that's why Jesus said it is more blessed to receive because the giver is focused on what he already has received in Christ. It's a gift from God, not something we've earned ourselves. You see, something I struggle with a lot of times, and I, it's probably more on me than it is on anybody else, but I have problems when people say, I deserve this, or they deserve something, or you deserve this. And I understand where you're coming from. The psalmist reminds us, Proverbs reminds us, you know, to give honor to whom honor, tribute to him tribute, custom to whom custom. But for whatever reason, when I hear that language, it really just bothers me. You know what we deserve? We deserve nothing. In fact, if we all got what we deserve and we asked if God to be fair, none of us would be here today. But God in his grace has given us everything. Freely you have received. Freely we are to give. And the best part about giving is when you don't expect anything in return. Just recently on Christmas Eve, I was making my way to Bardstown. Our family on mom's side has a Christmas Eve thing that they do. I tried to get there that afternoon and get back uh, that night for our Christmas Eve candlelight service. And on the way, I stopped and got some health food at McDonald's, me and about 30 other cars. And I was back there in Hardensburg, stopped up. And when I got to the window, somebody said, well, whoever's ahead of you has paid for your for your meal. I said, well, that's really nice of them. I try to recognize the vehicle. I don't recognize anybody's vehicle. I can't see anything on the road. I try to see where the, where the plate is from. And they took off before I had a chance. And so I said, all right, the next person behind me, let me get theirs. Let's see if we can keep this going. I think my meal was like $3 or something like that. The person behind me was like 10. And I thought, you know, I, I, I lost out on this investment here. And then I thought, you know what, that's not the point of doing this. 
Freely you have received. Freely give. Make a big order when somebody does that. You know, make sure you get it all paid off. The whole point of giving is that it reminds us not what we can do for others, not what they can do for us, but what God has done for us in Christ. Freely you've received. Freely give. And so we give with a cheerful attitude. We give with a cheerful heart. And your response to giving will always be indicative of your understanding of grace. Jesus tells another parable, somewhat related to giving, when he talks about men out in the field being hired by the master laborer. One shows up at 6 o'clock, works a full day. One shows up at 9. One shows up at noon. One shows up at 3. And one shows up at 5, right before quitting time at 6. And the master lines them all out at the end of the day, and he gives them all a denarius, a day's wages. And obviously the people who have worked all day, 12 hours, are way more upset than the guy who's worked one hour. And they said, we deserve more than he does. We've toiled the entire day away. Why are you doing this? And the master responds, do I not have a right to give what I said I would give? The truth is, if we understand Jesus, when we look at what we deserve, or we look at what we've earned compared to everybody else, we are all 11th hour workers. We're all hired at the last minute. And God, in his grace, has given us Christ. Can we not freely give what we have freely received? Here's the neat thing about the offering. Paul, the Jew, is making offerings on behalf of the Gentiles. And the church here in Corinth, a Gentile church, who received the gospel from the Jews, is now giving the gospel through money back to them. It's come full circle. The measurement of the gospel has come back. The grace of God has been returned on their behalf. I would just encourage you in this. You say, I can't afford to give a tithe. You know, 10% of what we talk about, an Old Testament principle. You say, now we're under grace. I would say, yeah, we ought to be that much more free than how we give. You say, well, I just, I just can't afford to do that right now. Can I encourage you just to start somewhere? And to recognize, if you were to say, God... I'm going to trust you with this, even when I don't have it. God will provide. I've never met a person who went bankrupt because they tithed. <laughs> met a lot of people who did because they bought too big of a house or too fancy of a car. But nobody who honored the Lord. And then I would encourage you, even beyond financial giving, offer God a blank check with your life. Be all in. Say, God, I will live and I will give wholeheartedly because you have done the same for me. I have a couple of these in my possession. I got one of them that I'll put on display for you. Does anybody know what this is? You probably can't really see it all that well. I'm trying not to smudge it. It looks like a piece of dirt that I picked out in the parking lot, but that's not what it is. I've got a certificate of authenticity, whatever that's worth. This is a widow's mite. It was the cheapest form of currency in the Roman world. A lot of the other coins have the image of, of Caesar on them or they have some value in them with gold or silver. The widow's mite was the cheapest form you could make. I mean, it, it doesn't look like anything. You can see this afterwards up close if you want to. And yet Jesus does something significant with this. The only reason we know about the widow's mite today is because Jesus talks about the lady who gave. She comes up she gives just a, a couple of these in the offering play. It would have been worth just a couple of pennies. And Jesus says, surrounded by rich and well-to-do and learned people, this woman has given more than all of you combined because she has given her all. Not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And we look to a God who did not shortchange any of us, but freely on the cross gave his son. How can we not respond to a God like that, you are never more like Christ than when you give. So let's give. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.